Hi everyone, uh, this should be Musa here, the executive coordinator of African Forum from Army of Care. Great to have you all here today. We're really pleased to have Dr. Gary Lawden, who's an internal physician and a clinical rheumatologist fellow from Chris Hardy Barry Barnett Hospital, Academic Hospital in Johannesburg, South Africa. The Afro PHC tries to, try to have his weekly um, CPD meeting. Um, and offering it to a wide variety of people across South Africa. And um, we will hope that uh, you know, it does get our uh, benefit. So while I'm um, getting poll, I'd like to get a sense if you can just uh, fill in the quick poll so we get a sense of who is around uh, in the meeting today. And we'll just keep that for a few seconds running. Uh, I think Dr. Lawden would appreciate that quite strongly. Um, so Dr. Lawton, as I mentioned, is a hematologist in Chris Hanibara, and he's going to be talking, he's also linked to the Univitz University, he's going to talk about iron and iron deficiency anemia. Uh, he, Dr. Lawton completed his undergraduate medical education at the University of Witwatersrand and qualified as a specialist physician uh, after completing his registrar training in his MMed in internal medicine at the University of Pretoria. Um, he's currently a fellow in clinical hematology at Chris Hani Barra at Gwaneth Academic Hospital in Johannesburg. So great to have all of you. I hope that more of you of the 27 people here today can uh, just fill in this so that people can get a good idea of who is around. I think we'll wait for a few more to just put that in and then we'll turn over to Dr. Lawden. Great. Okay, I will... Stop at about, yeah. Okay, um, so um, you can see that we have uh, Dr. Lawton, we have uh, family physician, medical officers, lots of interns, really we grateful that you're joining us, um, all from Southern Africa, Gauteng, and in Johannesburg with some people from Ushwane and Ekureleni, which is really great. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Lawden. I'll just stop sharing and then you can continue um, to share your slides. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof, for the introduction. Great. Can see. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Um, so today's topic is on nutritional anemias and it's a focus on iron deficiency specifically. And you'll see why this is important later on during this presentation, why iron deficiency is such an important um, focus, especially in the South African and the African context um, in general. So this is the first case. Um, she's an 18 year old female and she presented with a history of heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, so it's important, obviously, with each patient to take a comprehensive bleeding history, um, especially when you suspect that there may be an iron deficiency. Um, and as you know, so menorrhagia or abnormal menstrual bleeding, more than 80 mils at, at, um, you know, at one point. But again, to ask your patients if they have um, about their menstrual history, um, if it is appropriate, if there's any changes um, specifically. So in this patient, she does have an elevated white cell count. So it's a, a leukocytosis with a bit of a, um, a neutrophilia. So there may be a concurrent um, infection as well. But I've noticed that she has um, an anemia and HB of 5.3, an MCV of 74, which is low. So generally the rule is 80 to 100. Um, and then the MCHC or MCH, which is also low in this patient as well. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to the Mensa index at this point, which we, you know, in the African context as well, differentiates between thalassemia and between iron deficiency. This is an important index to use. Um, and I'll tell you about its interpretation um, in a bit. So just looking further at her lab indices is that she had normal folate, serum folate, normal vitamin B12. But of note here is that she had a ferritin of seven, um, which in this case would be diagnostic of an iron deficiency. Um, concurrent with a decrease in her ferritin or serum ferritin is an increase in the transferrin. And this is obviously to scavenge whatever iron is available um, in this patient for transfer to hemopoietic tissue for erythropoiesis. This is the peripheral blood morphology of this, um, this patient. As you can see, um, so the neutrophils are not well represented here just in this field, but the focus is more on the red blood cells. 
Um, and in these patients, you can see that there is an anisopoikular cytosis. So there's a variation in size of the red cells. You have these smaller red cells here with my, um, my cursor. And then, you know, these bit larger, more well hemoglobinized cells. And the shape does differ in um, these patients as well. So you can see these teardrops here. Um, there's maybe the occasional elliptocyte or pencil cell here. But again, generally there's a, an anisopoikular cytosis. And then if we examine the chromia of these cells, so generally we expect that the area of central pallor in these red cells should be about one third. Um, and if it's more than one third, the central area of pallor of the area of the red cell, we then worried about a hypochromic um, picture, which in this patient we would suspect as she had a reduction in her mean cell hemoglobin concentration. Case two, um, this is a 40 year old uh, male gentleman or gentleman, sorry who is retroviral disease positive and he's on ARVs. Um, he has a CD4 cell count of 763 and an HIV viral load of 27. He presented with a severe symptomatic anemia and then on full blood count, he was noted to have a bicytopenia. So this is important in these patients just to have a composite picture and to look what accompanies the anemia to see if this is a central or bone marrow um, abnormality. He had no lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly. And this is important in patients with chronic diseases or chronic illnesses, um, especially in patients who have retroviral disease as they may be HIV associated uh, non-Hodgkin um, lymphomas. And clinically there was no overt uh, source of blood loss and the patient didn't report any bleeding as well. And also just to try and link these, these counts. So in a patient with a thrombocytopenia, you can, you know, I'm not saying that this is an immune thrombocytopenia, but to try and link this low uh, platelet count with, with a bleeding history. Um, obviously this, this hemoglobin is, is markedly low. Um, and in this patient, there could be multifactorial um, etiologies for his, his bicytopenia. So let's just go through that he has a white cell count of 6.14. I'm sorry, that shouldn't be red, but um, uh, it's within normal limit. Just to note that in this patient and the, the prior patient as well is that the red cell count is also decreased which is in keeping with the reduction in red cell mass, although we don't often use this as a, as a marker. But when we get onto the MENSA index, I'll show you how this is important. The hemoglobin is 2.7, so this would be a severe anemia. So just in terms of using the World Health Organization classification of anemia is that it would be a grade four anemia because it's less than 6.5. The MCV is reduced, and so is the mean cell hemoglobin concentration of this patient. The red cell distribution width which is a marker of the variation or the variability in red cell um, size is also increased in this patient, which may be as a result of the change in the cell size or shape or reflection of the anisocytosis. The platelets are also low, they're 58. He also has a reduction in the reticular site production index, um, which is of concern. So it should be in a case where there's an active marrow, uh, one or above. These are his lab indices. So you can see here that he had a ferritin of, um, of seven as well. Um, his transferrin in this case was not um, elevated. So there was, um, usually this would be elevated in iron deficiency anemia. And he did have a reduction in his transferrin saturation. Um, later on in the presentation, I'm going to mention how you can kind of differentiate in, in an anemia of chronic inflammation and associated iron deficiency anemia as well. So this is a picture of the, um, what we expected the bone marrow to look like. So this is bone marrow aspirate. Um, and then we use a special stain called the pearls or Prussian blue stain. And you can see that generally we examine particles. Um, so this is a magnified image. We, uh, we look at the particles to see if there's associated iron. I'm gonna show you what a normal um, trephine would look like, or sorry, an aspirate in the next um, slide. Um, so normal, sorry, this should read aspirate. So in a normal aspirate, um, bone marrow aspirate slide, you can see that the, with the pearls or Prussian blue stain that you have these clumps of iron, um, which are um, within these particles. So this would be a normal iron stain. And it's just important that, you know, iron deficiency can be recognized from your blood cell indices, but that your, your iron studies on your bone marrow aspirate remain definitive or the gold standard in, in diagnostics. Um, just to bear in mind that there is a differential for microcytosis, and this is important in the South African setting, as we have a lot of, um, we have a migrant population, we have um, a mixed population of different ethnicities, and also to bear in mind that we have patients from, you know, other countries visiting us, and that 
uh, hemoglobinopathies are also a consideration. So just to look at the differential for microcytosis is thalassemia, so that's tails mnemonic, anemia of chronic disease, so that's either infection, uh, malignancy, inflammatory disorders, iron deficiency, rarely patients may have um, lead poisoning or sideroblastic anemia. And sideroblastosis or sideroblastic anemia can be seen in cases, um, so reversible, irreversible, so it can be inher inherited or acquired. So I've mentioned to you the Mensa index, and this is particularly useful in differentiating cases of thalassemia, so generally or beta thalassemia, from iron deficiency anemia. So in these cases, we divide the mean cell volume, and we divide it by the red cell count. So in cases with iron deficiency, we expect that the denominator is usually reduced or decreased in the case of iron deficiency anemia. So overall, that would cause a um, index of more than 13. We divide the MCV by the red cell count. And then if we divide the MCV by the red cell count and it's less than 13, we suspect that there's a thalassemia. And this is because the denominator in this instance, the red cell count is generally elevated in cases of a thalassemia. And this is because these patients often have unstable um, red blood cells which hemolyze and would therefore increase the red blood cell count um, as a, as a uh, compensatory response for the, for the um, anemia. Let's just look at iron deficiency. So the role of iron, just a quick um, mention that it's used, obviously we know it's used in uh, reversible binding of oxygen and hemoglobin, also myoglobin as well. We know that it forms a, a large proportion of our erythroid um, mass. And then also to take note that it's used in enzyme systems, um, so heme and non-heme enzyme systems, and also used in immunity in terms of um, destroying free radicals. I mean, free radicals to destroy microbes. So the global burden of, of disease. So again, anemia in Africa is multifactorial. Um, and as you can see here that the predominant causes of anemia in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is listed here on the right of this, this bar graph, um, does constitute quite a significant um, prevalence in both uh, males and in females. And this is prevalence worldwide in males and females on the left. But again, by geographical area that it does constitute a significant um, prevalence in both South, East, Central and West Africa. And in males and females, obviously, there's a common um, denominator, which be parasitic infections or hookworm. Um, again, malaria is an important cause of iron deficiency anemia, well, and anemia overall. And then in females, to consider that the maternal hemorrhage is also a possible cause of this. Um, just to note that Southeast, um, South and East Asia constitute more than half of the world's um, anemia cases. So this basically just um, brings into light the importance of recognizing anemia and, and treating it accordingly. So this is basics of iron absorption. So this is a duodenal enterocyte. We know that the brush border is important in absorbing iron. We know that iron is taken from its ferric state to its uh, ferrous state. So Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus, and this is by ferroreductase. Um, and then this Fe2 plus or um, ferrous form um, is then absorbed by the divalent metal transporter, which is across this brush border. And we know that heme iron is generally absorbed better than non-heme iron. So iron that's absorbed or taken from um, animal or meat would be better absorbed than plant-based iron, for example. There's in a complex series of, of processes. Um, and then eventually at the basolateral surface, there's ferroportin. Um, ferroportin is important for the overall absorption of iron into the, the bloodstream. Um, and then we'll see how hepcidin, the, or the master regulator, or the master hormone, is important in blocking absorption of iron across the ferroportin channel um, and mediating anemia in chronic inflammation. Also just to note that uh, your divalent metal transporter on the brush border, um, as well as ferroportin are regulated by hypoxia inducible factor. And this is a factor which is produced in the kidneys, which basically senses, um, so the kidneys basically sense a decrease in oxygen saturation or oxygen tension. And if this is reduced, they'll then produce hypoxia inducible factor, which is important in upregulating um, iron absorption from the, from the gut. So the cycling of iron, there's obviously different compartments where iron is absorbed. The majority of iron is contained within erythroid precursors or hemoglobin within the bone marrow. There also is iron in the splenic macrophages, and this is as a result of the splenic macrophages sequestering or removing senescent red blood cells and they recycle this iron. 
And then we also have plasma ion, which is basically um, incorporated or found on plasma transfer. And this is important in the carriage or the transport of iron um, from, from basically from absorption, from splenic macrofa macrophages back to erythroid um, precursors. So iron, as I've mentioned before, is in hemoglobin, myoglobin, and enzymes. And the storage is in the liver, spleen, as well as in the marrow, where we have these macrophages, which basically remove senescent red blood cells. So the take home message from this slide is that there's no clear way to excrete iron. So tight homeostatic controls therefore exist to regulate iron absorption, recycling, and storage. This is, um, I'm not gonna go into too much about the, you know, how hepcidin works as a master regulator or master hormone, but just to note that hepcidin is important in blocking certain um, mechanisms of uptake of iron. So it, it binds ferroportin, ferroportin again, the port for absorption of iron, and this is from your duodenal enterocytes. So it blocks it there on the enterocytes as well as macrophages. So that's why in anemia of chronic inflammation or chronic disease, you will have a markedly elevated ferritin. And this is because it blocks the release of storage iron from macrophages and also blocks um, its utilization by other compartments of the body. Hepcidin expression, it's stimulated by an increase in iron and inflammation. And then its expression is suppressed by an increase in erythropoiesis generally. Just to note that its upregulation of hepcidin is with inflammation, so interleukin-6, and then this will result in iron transfer block. And downregulation of hepcidin occurs in cases of erythroblast-derived um, forms. So just to note that in thalassemia, um, although we have hemolysis and we have breakdown of red cells, we may have an elevated or increased ferritin, not only because of recurrent transfusions, but also because your erythroblasts are turning over at such a fast rate that they produce erythroferrin. Erythroferrin is then able to downregulate hepcidin, and this then you know, prevents or does not suppress the uptake of iron from enterocytes or at least from macrophages. And this adds fuel to the fire by absorbing or constituting a greater ferritin load. So the approach to iron deficiency is basically I3. So I3 mnemonic is basically identification, investigation, and then subsequent repletion um, of iron stores. So there are certain sequences of events in iron deficiency. So we want to recognize iron deficiency early on when there's a depletion of iron stores. We don't want to reach the state where we um, have tissue effects of iron deficiency, which I'll show you in a couple of pictures. Um, so this basically demonstrates that we need to detect iron deficiency early on and suspect it early on. So we can have depletion of iron stores, iron deficient erythropoiesis, and at this point, we still have a normal MCV, MCHC, but with a reduction in ferritin. So it's important not to just rely on the fact that a patient may have a normal hemoglobin, normal MCV, normal H, uh, MCHC, but still have a low ferritin. This is our area where we can target this and prevent um, overt or frank iron deficiency anemia. Identification. So this is the grading of the severity of anemia just for, for us to recognize what constitutes anemia. And this is from the World Health Organization. Just to note that this would be in grams per deciliter. Um, it's important to know that in a pregnant woman, um, non-anemia or anemia, sorry, is diagnosed in the hemoglobin level, which is less than 11. Um, and also just to be able to stage and to grade um, severity of anemia as mild, moderate, and then um, severe. Symptoms of iron deficiency. I mean, these patients uh, or symptoms of iron deficiency overall, um, generally it affects epithelial surfaces. So you'll see that these patients will have um, hair loss. They will have, um, uh, they may have uh, glossitis, um, then they have angular stomatitis as well. And just to appreciate that they can have cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory changes. And this is a reduction in overall iron transportation by hemoglobin. Of note, and what we tend to forget about is that um, iron deficiency in itself has a number of CNS as well as um, musculoskeletal complications. So in terms of CNS complications itself, whether or not the cognitive decline or um, dysfunction is as a result of the reduction in um, oxygen transport or the iron deficiency itself, but they have fatigue, depression, sleep disturbance. And then one thing that we don't really, um, we don't really lay focus on is that patients may present with restless legs. 
Um, and this itself can resolve with the repletion of iron. So just to note, um, that is an important when the patient presents with restless legs, um, with cognitive dysfunction or you know, cognitive changes, um, depression, that to consider iron deficiency as a possible cause. So signs of iron deficiency, again, they may have an angular stomatitis, um, and this is um, important to recognize. They may have typical spoon-shaped nails, and this would occur in you know, the later stages of iron deficiency when there's epithelial changes. They may have pallor. Um, just to note that the, um, the best place to look for pallor is generally in the conjunctiva. Um, this diagram here from um, below just looks at the likelihood ratios and what is the best clinical sign for detecting pallor. And in this case, it would be conjunctival rim pallor followed by palmar crease pallor, which is indicated in the diagram B on the right-hand side. Again, pallor, palmar pallor or pallor at any site and facial pallor are less um, likely um, to yield a higher likelihood ratio for um, eliciting iron deficiency. Again here, this may appear to be leukonychia, uh, but again, they may have pale, um, pale nail, nail beds um, they may also have nail changes as well, as I mentioned before, the cholinicia. We can see that this tongue appears as if there's a glossitis, so they can have a loss of papillation or the normal papilla on the, the tongue surface. Again, an epithelial change in iron deficiency, which in itself can be restored once iron deficiency is, is corrected. So looking at the laboratory values and defining iron deficiency. So some laboratory values use um, 45, um, micrograms per liter as a cutoff for ferritin. But generally, if we use a threshold of 30, it's able to identify with a good sensitivity and specificity a much greater proportion of patients with iron deficiency. Again, the MCV is reduced in less than 75. Transferrin saturation is reduced. Another marker that we can use is an earlier marker of iron deficiency, which is not widely available, um, certainly not within the, the NHLS, although I stand to be corrected is the reticular site or reticulate hemoglobin content. And then again, bone marrow, which is not recommended for routine screening, but is the gold standard for detecting absent iron stores. So I've just put here a note that a threshold of ferritin of less than 30 achieves a higher sensitivity while maintaining a higher specificity for the diagnosis of iron deficiency. And then an earlier marker of iron deficiency is the reticulated or reticulate hemoglobin content. Again, this is pretty similar to what I've mentioned before with those other, um, the other images, is that we basically want to identify iron deficiency in these patients without anemia. So again, there's different stages of development of iron deficiency. So iron deficiency without anemia, with mild anemia, and then severe iron deficiency with severe anemia, where they have these um, epithelial changes, so skin changes, nail changes, as well as um, changes in the mucosa. Um, and again, they've used a threshold here of 40 nanograms per mil, which may identify um, you know, a greater proportion of patients with iron deficiency who may be at risk of developing overt iron deficiency. Again, anemia of chronic disease or inflammation with concomitant iron deficiency. Again, the anemia of uh, well, iron deficiency remains difficult or more challenging to diagnose in concomitant inflammation, patients who have heart failure, in preoperative settings when there's an increase in inflammatory cytokines, and in those patients who have chronic kidney disease or who have chronic kidney disease on dialysis. So this is a table which is taken from um, the American Society of Hematology, which summarizes quite nicely um, the values or ferritin values that should be used together with transferrin saturation in diagnosing concomitant iron deficiency in patients who have chronic inflammation or disease. It's important to note that the challenge also um, is uh, difficult in the elderly. And this is because ferritin increases with age. Ferritin is also an acute phase reactant, as we know. So generally with inflammation, a ferritin value less than 100 with a transferrin saturation less than 20 is suitable for the diagnosis of iron deficiency. Of note is that, um, you know, there have been some reports in some papers of recognizing iron deficiency early on in heart failure and subsequently repeating or restoring iron stores in these patients to improve symptoms um, of heart failure together with um, traditional um, treatments or therapeutic measures. Investigation. So investigation relies on what are the causes of iron deficiency. So this broadly just looks at decreased iron availability, 
as well as an increase in iron need. I think in the appropriate setting to realize that certain physiological states are important to realize and recognize iron deficiency. And these are cases of pregnancy, when iron deficiency has a number of implications, not only for, for the mother, but also for the unborn fetus. Uncorrected iron deficiency in these patients, especially in the fetus, can result in sometimes irreparable cognitive dysfunction within these, um, within these children. Childhood as well as a rapid uh, growth state um, that you need to be aware of iron deficiency, especially if there's um, a reduction in intake of iron through foods that are not fortified or through diets that are, are not iron replete. Um, blood loss, it's important to consider this as well. So through a number of routes, gastrointestinal, PV bleeding, genital urinary, also to consider those patients who donate blood frequently, as well as epistaxis. And then again, considering those cases in which intake or absorption is um, suboptimal. This is just a slide, again, which summarizes the causes of iron deficiency. So again, overarching, which you can see here in this yellow um, circle here, is that we have the chronic stuff, of it, as I've listed it. So we have chronic eating disease, chronic heart failure, chronic infections, malignancy, inflammation, and this needs to be addressed overall as well and to be recognized overall. We then look at the state of water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. So these are cases in which you, know, you may have an adequate intake of iron, however, absorption is suboptimal. So this is generally through the GI tract when there's decreased absorption. And this is when we concomitantly administer uh, proton pump inhibitors in patients who have, um, you know, with iron supplementation, gluten-induced enteropathy, autoimmune atrophic gastritis, H. pylori associated um, decrease in absorption, as well as genetic causes when there's certain genetic aberrations, which result in iron um, refractory iron deficiency anemia. So you keep giving iron, um, you know, replacements to these patients, but they still have an iron deficiency anemia. Just to look at autoimmune gastritis, again, this wouldn't be the number one or the, certainly the first test that you would conduct in these patients, but just to bear in mind that they can have autoimmune gastritis, celiac disease, and, and H. pylori as well. So those patients who need more, those patients who need more because they have an increase in physiological, physiological requirements. So infants, adolescents and preschool children, and then especially pregnancy is our focus um, as well. Those patients who are on um, ESA, so they are on erythropoietin um, for chronic kidney disease, for example, will need iron as a substrate um, to produce hemoglobin. So we don't get enough in. This is a malnutrition, the extremes of you know, diet, so vegetarianism, veganism, or simply um, you know, patients who live in you know, low income or low resource areas who don't have access or don't have food security. Then those patients where the passage of iron or the iron loss is greater than that that's taken in. So this can be, again, to consider that in certain patients, this may be urinary losses. So do they have chronic intravascular hemolysis, for example, with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea? But I mean, the, this wouldn't be a diagnosis we jumped to at the outset. GIT loss, genital urinary loss, patients who are on dialysis and those who frequently donate blood. Iron repletion. So blood transfusions, we generally do not um, avoid and we tend to keep it for those patients who have severe iron deficiency anemia and who have cardiovascular compromise and or debilitating symptoms. Oral iron formulations are generally preferred and we generally prefer the iron salts because those are generally what we have that is available. Treatment duration will depend on the ongoing loss as well as the iron deficit. There are a number of calculations on UpToDate and MDCalc on smartphone applications where you can calculate this iron deficit. Typical duration of treatment in patients depending on you know, diagnosing the ongoing loss and treating and preventing the loss um, to restoring um, iron stores is generally six weeks to six months. And then this is another controversial aspect of replacing oral iron or with oral iron formulations. Generally dosing is done on a alternate day week, um, alternate days of the week. So generally we prefer a regimen of Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and this is just based on the rationale that higher doses of iron that are administered on a particular day. So sometimes people will give you know, 200 milligrams TDS to a patient with iron deficiency, hoping that iron absorption is going to be increased. And this is not the case. Iron itself is quite irritated to the gastric mucosa. 
And this then, you know, exacerbates the problem of reduction in iron absorption. Again, we know that administering a lot of iron on one point or one day, you know, might um, result in hepcidin, upregulation of hepcidin, and therefore blocking further absorption of iron from the um, duodenal enterocytes. So that's why we administer um, medications or iron salts on alternate days of the week um, as a simple alternative way to, um, you know, administering this um, a number of tablets on one particular day um, at a particular high dose. So again, generally we use iron salts that are available. So ferrous gluconate, sulfate, ferrous fumarate. And all of these just depend on the amount of elemental iron that is available within the tablets. So this would just depend on um, the availability of the iron salts within your center. And again, with a higher elemental iron concentration, um, so with fumar ferrous fumarate, you can administer it one day, one tablet per day, or once every other day, which is a preferred um, mechanism of administration. Again, it's important to note that you should take it on an empty stomach, and then there's no real evidence for administration or co-administration of vitamin C in these cases, um, but you may or could consider administration with high vitamin C containing foods, take it at a different time of day than an, 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 sorry, than an antacid, so um, just to be aware of patients who are on or taking Gaviscon or antacids or aluminum preparations, although they generally aren't really available um, anymore in state sector, also administer at a different time um, to which the patient takes a proton pump inhibitor. And again, an acidic environment is required and that's why we administer it at a different time away from an, an antacid or proton pump inhibitor. Just to note that Certainly iron deficiency without anemia. So in those patients who have a reduced ferritin um, and have a, a normal hemoglobin that you could consider um, dietary advice for these patients. So I'll give a slide later on with iron rich foods, um, also improving or increasing elemental daily iron intake or alternate days. So as I've mentioned, they can take ferrous salts um, on alternate days for at least 25 days. Um, if they're still tolerant to this, so again, you need to ask patients about um, do they have any associated side effects with the oral iron? So do they have um, gastric complaints? Um, do they have, uh, also ask them about their bowel movements? Do they have um, black tarry stools? Um, and this is important to then distinguish from Melina as opposed to a patient who just has um, a change in the color of their stools from a co-administration of iron tablets. If is the patient tolerant to the ferrous um, salts that you give them, then you can continue treatment in these patients until the, um, you repeat the blood tests in six to eight weeks. And is the ferritin corrected? Sure, then you can then rearrange or um, continue follow up for six to 12 months. And then again, I think the most important take home message from this, um, from this slide is that you need to identify the reason why these patients have um, an associated iron deficiency. So it's always important to look for the, the cause and not just treat the, the symptoms. Intravenous iron, the conditions that we would use intravenous iron, we generally use it when there is oral iron intolerance. So they have, you know, gastric complaints of, um, you know, gastritis, abdominal pain. Are they iron refractory? So this is again, despite optimal administration of intravenous iron, despite optimal compliance um, or adherence by patients, they may have defective absorption in the case of um, a gastrectomy, duodenal bypass, um, or previous bariatric surgery. Do they have uh, inf inflammatory bowel disease and atrophic gastritis, helicobacter pylori? Do they have genetic forms which uh, would mediate a reduction in iron absorption? So iron um, refractory, iron deficiency anemia. Um, and this is generally when there's no hemoglobin improvement after four weeks of oral therapy. In patients who have severe anemia, um, so less than seven to eight grams per de deciliter, second and third trimesters of um, pregnancy. Generally in these patients, because the, um, the consequences of an iron deficiency in, in a, gravid, um, a gravid female, especially for the patient, the consequences of iron deficiency in the, um, the patient and the fetus, um, it's important for us to you know, um, replace iron stores. Those patients who are on um, erythropoiesis stimulating agents, so those patients on hemodialysis or those with chronic kidney disease, Chronic blood loss, which is difficult to manage with oral iron, so that's when loss is greater than intake. Um, so while we're still trying to address the problem of heavy uterine bleeding, um, it's important for us to replace the iron. And then again, post-operative anemia of major surgery. 
um, but being aware to um, prevent co-administration of these iron compounds in patients who have you know, active infections. Um, and in those patients, as I've mentioned before, with chronic systolic heart failure, that there is evidence that heart failure symptoms may improve with administration of intravenous iron um, supplementation. So intravenous iron, so in terms of calculating which, um, you know, what dose of iron to give in these patients, there are formulas, as I mentioned up to date in MD calc, that sometimes your total doses of iron that you've calculated um, for repletion, maybe more than a thousand milligrams of elemental iron. Um, in this case, there are trials such as the FIRM trial, which has shown that there's actually no evidence that administering total doses of iron or intravenous iron above a thousand milligrams of elemental iron um, is shown to be useful. So generally we tend to cap it at about a thousand milligrams of elemental iron um, intravenously infused. And this is obviously not um, a thousand milligrams on one day, but it generally depends on what combination that you, you know, or what drug you have available for administration. So for example, if you have Venafur or if you have Cosmofur, which is not listed here, but if we look at Venafur, for example, giving two to 300 milligrams per day as an infusion, um, again, as I mentioned, delay intravenous iron administration in patients with active infection until the infection is resolved. It's important to note that upon administration of intravenous iron that you may have um, symptoms um, that you need to be aware of. So in terms of, um, you obviously need to watch out for anaphylaxis. If the patient develops frank hypotension, um, changes in respiration, wheezing, chest tightness, um, and other features of anaphylaxis, it's important to immediately um, stop the infusion, not to repeat the infusion, and obviously introduce your ACLS measures and deal with, um, with the hypotension. So it's important that not to take it uh, lightly in terms of administering intravenous iron um, and to always be prepared for the side effects of this drug. If a patient develops mild symptoms such as flushing, um, so they may have redness of the face, they may have um, you know, some back pain or joint pain upon administration, you don't necessarily have to um, stop the infusion. You can stop the infusion and then just see after 15, 20 minutes, if the side effects resolve, you may then continue the, um, the administration of it. But again, in those patients who have developed anaphylaxis or severe symptoms or severe compromise, you wouldn't re-administer the intravenous, intravenous iron um, again. So monitoring responses to iron supplementation is that you generally expect a rise in hemoglobin to begin about one to two weeks after the initiation of treatment. The hemoglobin should rise about two grams per deciliter over about three weeks. Hemoglobin deficit, so the reduction or the deficit from normal should have halved by approximately one month in essence. And the hemoglobin should continue to normal um, or should return to normal about uh, six to eight weeks after the initiation of oral supplementation. And obviously this depends on um, if you've managed to identify areas of chronic loss and correct that as well. With intravenous iron supplementation, patients generally should be seen four to eight weeks after the iron has been administered. Um, and again, as I stress, to identify the causes of uh, the cause of blood loss. So looking at PICA symptoms, so it's generally PICA in itself, which is the intake of non-nutritive substances, um, may in itself be a symptom or a cause of an anemia. So a patient who enjoys eating chalk or ice, um, sometimes craving for non-nutritive substances. So again, as Prof Lowe from Cape Town has said, is that sometimes patients may crave um, you know, and eat a whole packet of tomatoes um, as their form of pica. So it's important to recognize um, these symptoms. But again, these symptoms tend to resolve on the administration of iron. Um, pica as a cause for iron deficiency, again, patients who eat soil or sand, they may pick up a number of helminths from the soil or sand, and this could be a cause for the anemia. Tongue papillation and the glossitis tends to resolve um, fairly, you know, fairly soon after administration of iron. And restless leg syndrome, in its association with iron deficiency anemia, will resolve within 72 hours of iron replacement. Obviously, there are other neurological causes of restless leg syndrome, which wouldn't in itself um, be resolved with iron deficiency anemia, I mean, with iron repletion. Again, these are food sources of high iron content. Um, so cereals that are generally fortified. Um, kidneys, so generally your organs or your organ meat, such as the livers, kidneys, um, tends to have a high iron content or iron concentration. 
again, what happens when a patient does not respond to therapy? How do we troubleshoot this? So we have to look at compliance. So we have to address why or is the patient compliant to the medication and address why they may not be compliant to the medication. So address the side effects of oral iron, um, consider a dose change, maybe consider changing the formulation that would obviously depend on your pharmacy. So changing or alternating from a tablet to a liquid formulation, administering with milk, as well as using a stool softener. Sometimes these patients may complain of, um, of constipation and this may um, prevent them from taking this tablet. So it's important that you address uh, the issue, give them a stool softener. Absorption, so avoid enteric coated tablets, avoid co-administration with medications or food which decrease absorption. So to be aware of certain foods which decrease absorption, such as your phytates and um, tannins, your so-called toast and tea um, diet, um, avoid administration with co-administration with a proton pump inhibitor, your histamine two receptor blockers and acids, as well as tea. And then be aware in those patients which absorption is precluded by rapid intestinal transport. So those patients who have short bowel syndrome, for example, um, this would be important to address this. Introduce and always, um, sorry, entertain coexisting disease such as inflammation. Um, monitor and find um, certain sources of loss. So monitor and treat ongoing losses and then reevaluate the diagnosis. Consider alternative diagnoses in these patients, especially if they have um, you know, other nutrient deficiencies that they may have celiac disease um, or gluten losing um, enteropathy. And then appropriate referral. And um, if you know, your iron deficiency doesn't um, respond to adequate, to adequate therapy and you've addressed compliance issues. Um, thank you. That is, um, that is my presentation. Uh, thank you just... very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lorton. I think it was very comprehensive. Uh, I see we have a couple of questions. Um, there's a question by Robert Hunt. Uh, perhaps I'll take one from Farhan Karim in the chat, but please put it on the Q&A. Uh, would you recommend routine ferritin, ferritin levels in chronic patients, uh, example, HIV, along with the CDP viral load, UNE, before they become symptomatic? Um, perhaps you want to clarify how you'd use, um, you know, what sort of investigation to do in global transfer and um, these transfer and saturation and ferritin. Do you want to just share that? Yeah. So I wouldn't routinely, um, you know, do ferritin levels in patients with chronic or comorbid conditions unless I expected that they may have reason to have an associated iron deficiency. Um, certainly you'd have to take a... You know, Sorry, I think my connection is not that great. Can you hear me? All right. It's, um, all right. You just don't mind repeating what you just said. Uh, I think we quite Hi, Prof. So I just said that um, we wouldn't routinely measure ferritin levels um, in patients in whom we didn't suspect that there would be you know, a coexisting iron deficiency. So I think that we'd have to look at a composite, um, uh, you know, composite examination of a patient's full blood count. So look mm -hmm. for an overall microcytosis. Um, mm -hmm. But also then if we you know, have reason to suspect that a patient may be you know, iron deficient, so we've taken you know, from a history point of view, from a point of view that they may have underlying malnutrition, then you could, for example, consider doing a ferritin and looking at your transference saturation as, as a marker. Um, mm. Certainly if you know, your patient with um, retroviral disease has a bone marrow, you may also see that there may be certain uh, features on the full blood, um, on the bone marrow aspirate or the pearl stain, the iron stain, which would give you better, better information. But I would say mm. overall, if, if a patient is symptomatic and you suspect there's iron deficiency, I would do you know, your iron studies, um, but then just be aware of how you would interpret um, these iron studies. So look at your ferritin, look at your um, transfer and saturation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think clinical indications, because often the problem in the primary care is we've got to be careful with the use of investigations. Exactly. And um, you know, just doing them routinely isn't very good practice. Um, so I think, the, you know, to be clear, if I may ask this question, you know, you pointed out the iron deficiency anemia or iron deficiency without an anemia. What kind of setting would you actually say, let me do a ferritin to pick up that? Give me, you know, give us a sense of how you might land up doing that. 
So I think that would depend on, you know, who is at risk. The sort of, of clinical scenarios, yeah. Yeah. I think that it would be, you'd have to have a high index, index of suspicion of who you would suspect. I mean, right. so if you, if you have a patient who, for example, tells you that they have heavy menstrual bleeding or they have, you know, right. melina and they still have a normal hemoglobin, not to just take it as a, um, a kind of rule out that there's no associated yeah. iron deficiency. Yeah. Um, certainly if they have certain, you know, complaints, um, you know, fatigue, tiredness, it may represent, you know, that your hemoglobin is on a downward trend. Um, so I think it would circle mostly around history, history taking, and who you would suspect would develop or be at risk of developing iron deficiency. Right. So useful. And then you'd use the transfer in saturation, uh, you know, in the case where you're not sure that there's chronic disease um, and you'd want to be able to distinguish that. Um, yeah. Is that so a would, way you'd use that? Yeah. So I'd use my ferritin together with uh, transfer in saturation as probably being the most important um, mm. things to use from the from the iron studies especially yeah. if there's a chronic if you're suspecting chronic inflammation yeah and usually if there's not clinical evidence for it because if there is you'd probably say well that's probably a contributory cause would that change your management in terms of the iron deficiency and um, in terms of I mean, you know, if it's an iron deficiency anemia of other causes you're treating the patient you know i mean you you're not very clear there's some sort of loss you might say there's loss chronic disease, would your management in terms of replenishing the iron be much the same? I think know, it would be, again, I think the overarching thing would be to treat the, the chronic chronic disease concurrently. Disease, of course, but when I you think, have it. Yes, when, you, when you're aware of it, and then obviously introducing um, iron replenishment during that course as well. And then hopefully, you know, as a multifactorial um, mm. addressing, you know, the management, um, hopefully the anemia will improve. Great. So I hope Pran has been answered by that. I think uh, Robert Hunt asked a question, how common is an anaphylactic reaction to IV iron? Um, do you want to share that? So it's not a, a, not a very common, um, not a very common um, you know, reaction. Again, up to date just basically says that, uh, you know, obviously take this from a patient who has um, maybe a history of A to P before. So they generally look at patients mm -hmm. who are diagnosed as asthmatic or who have concurrent allergies um, to be aware in those patients that they may be at a high risk of developing um, anaphylaxis. Mm. Um, so I think, I, again, to be, I be aware... the administration as well. Exactly. Also, yeah. just the one thing with, you know, routinely do not administer, you know, antihistamines routinely, as this itself can kind of cloud the, you know, the, the I mean, if the person then develops hypotension, you're not sure if it's from the iron supplementation mm. yeah. or if it's from the antihistamine itself. So don't routinely administer... Um, and mm. antihistamine together with um, with the iron, but again, okay. just take it in terms of you know population who may be at risk of developing A to P or um, mm. so you yeah. asthmatics, those with food allergies, etc. So A to P would be a good important problem to deal with. Um, so Franz asked the question: When to start oral ferrous iron in newly diagnosed PTP patients? I'm not sure that one would routinely start it, so perhaps you can respond to that. Um, again, I think that, I mean, you'd have to then prove it's definitively. A indication. The, exactly. I mean, if a patient is um, acutely unwell with uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, I mean, you wouldn't administer at that point, but certainly if mm. they've been on more continuation phase treatment, they're well, they're able to take orally. Um, I think that mm. their overall iron deficiency should improve um, with maybe dietary means when they, you know, That's feel right. better and able to take orally um, and not as um, well. And, and so treating the chronic disease is actually more important than replenishing, replenishing when there's an obvious chronic disease, exactly. uh, depending, of course, on the actual deficit. Exactly. Right. So routine administration of iron isn't exactly good stuff. I mean, I, I want to ask one or two questions. Um, perhaps we can take the last one and then I can ask a couple of questions as well. Um, Isinius, Isinius, Anisu, sorry, I forgot the name wrong. Um, in patients who require both PPIs and oral iron, uh, how do you actually manage that? Sort of one in the morning, one in the night. So I, I mean, I would probably um, you know take the protein pump inhibitor as um, Shinesu has mentioned, probably in the morning. I'd probably take the iron probably with a meal, um, with your main meal later in the in the day. Um, hmm. So again, taking it with a glass of milk may decrease the side effects of of the medication. Yeah. Because um, the option is people would take milk in the morning more often than in the evening. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the common side effects that you've experienced with iron, what sort of challenges do patients come with mostly? So mostly they come with certain constipation. So again, 
changes in stool color, they report that you know they have this mm -hmm. um, blackish stool discoloration, so important in those patients to reassure them. So mostly GIT complications. Um, sometimes nausea. Nausea is another another complication. Not so much more constipation you experience. More constipation, more okay. um, yeah, certainly that. Yeah, and and I think you know you've pointed out the different iron options, and of course I think it depends on what's available. But you know, is the other different options? You know, gluconates, if, if, if fumarate. Are there different tolerance levels with those different formulations? So certainly the really? ones that have a that have a lower elemental iron. So uh -huh. generally, okay. ones that have a lower elemental iron um, generally tend to have less GIT side effects. Right. So it's just it's again dose dependent. So you can yeah. always try changes patients to another you know another formulation with a lower yeah. elemental iron dose. Um, so it's, it's really the iron dose that actually is sort of yes. the influence on the tolerance. Exactly. Okay. You mentioned yeah. tea. Is that a big influence? I mean, is that a big deal? I think it would depend in certain populations. So, I mean, we've, mm. as you mentioned, certainly those patients who have um, decreased access to, you know, adequate food, so they may have a toast and tea diet, um, right. you know, or, you know, people who routinely, you know, consume excess amounts of tea as the only form of nutrition, really. Um, mm. But it's not really a, a, maze, uh, a massive contributor yeah. to malabsorption. Just, just keep a note of it when we're talking to patients and feeding them iron. <laughs> Yeah. So thanks. I, I think, uh, you know, you, you sort of uh, shared a little bit about, you know, the importance of the uh, METSA uh, ratio, is it in, in thalassemias? Is that, uh, what's the prevalence of thalassemias? And perhaps, you know, you can go back to that slide about the prevalence in, in, in South Africa and uh, perhaps just share your experience in South Africa. What sort of other big, big things that uh, sort of emerge in the South African context? I thought you, you know, slides were really handy. They will be on the website, so you can, yeah, the one just now, I think you have that. So again, in these yeah. patients with hemoglobinopathy, so again, it would be dependent on where these patients fall. So do they generally fall in like your thalassemia mm. belt, which is generally Central, Central Africa, Mediterranean, um, Southeast mm, yeah. Asia. So let's just look at Southeast Asia here. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't appear as if thalassemia doesn't contribute a major um, proportion right of iron deficiency. But again, there's an important consideration if you are kind of stuck with a thalassemic range MCV. So an MCV that's yeah. markedly low, like 64, 65, you generally think that it's, you know, that's not really all due to iron deficiency, but to just mm. bear in mind, you know, other causes mm. of a microcytosis. Um, but mm. again, iron deficiency will be your, you know, your predominant focus. Um, you wouldn't jump yeah. to a thalassemia necessarily. Although malaria and, and hookworm is quite substantial in sort of parts of Africa. Exactly. Um, you know, the worms, and I think one actually doesn't always think consciously of those sort of things. Uh, exactly. I think even in an urban setting, we might miss that. And we should be cognizant. So we, we don't really think about that as much as we should. So, okay. and I think schistosmiasis actually surprisingly is quite a bit. Um, yes. I imagine we'd have to be just very wary of that. I mean, it's, it's much more than, you know, any of the sickle cell, uh, which is quite, exactly. uh, quite surprising. Well, um, I think, uh, you know, you also mentioned, uh, you know, the sort of hemoglobin change uh, per month. I was kind of computing and thinking to myself, well, you said six to eight weeks, but if a person comes in with an HB of eight, eight um, you know, if you're looking at two grams we, per month, yeah, sure. you're looking we, at lot, what, lot three shorter. months, perhaps? Yeah, so I think it's maybe best to use the, you know, the overall hemoglobin deficit. So looking at, you know, sort of the low limit of normal subtract from where they started from, and then right. kind of looking, looking at that. So okay. again, it'll have to be tailored, I think, per, you know, per person. And, and calculating would be the better option to be more sure. Otherwise, exactly. you could monitor the patient on a monthly basis and then just manage exactly. if, if it's all right. Um, well, I think those were some of my questions. I don't know if there are any other questions. I think there may be another one from Brett. Um, seen some patients drinking green tea extract tablets. Uh, could this lead to severe anemia? So sort of dietary choices that might lead to anemia. Do you have any uh, suggestion about that? Um, hi, Brett. I'm not really sure of the exact, um, you know, what's green the contents teas. of green tea itself. Um, oh. But I suspect that, I mean, you know, if a patient is taking green tea, so just to be aware of the other diet, like what other dietary preferences do they have that may be coexisting with that? Right. Um, but I'm not too sure. I have to go and see what's, um, what is in green so, tea. Yeah, uh, things that would absorb iron, you know, in their content. 
Are there yeah. any things that come to ha come to mind? Uh, things that one should be aware of? Because in primary care, we get all sorts of strange stuff happening, you know, especially with dietary choices. Well, anything that you can, uh, that you know offhand that might influence uh, anemia in terms of their dietary, besides the lack of, you know, iron in their diet? I think, I mean, okay. just um, phytates as well. I mean, certain, um, you know, t tannins as well and teas, as I've mentioned, those are the ones that, you know, the common causes of it. So again, right. patients who don't eat iron fortified, um, you know, bread, for example, although most of our iron is, you know, I think it is iron fortified and um, yeah. So I think food that's mm. just genuinely not iron rich or not fortified, um, mm. yeah. Well, I think that uh, we've come to the end of questions. I think everyone's enjoyed it tremendously and I think it's been very valuable. So thank you once again, once again uh, Dr. Loden. I uh, really appreciate you taking your time out on a Thursday um, to share with all these doctors. Let's just get a quick sense of who's been able to benefit. So I'm going to just uh, start again and um, let me just relaunch the poll and let's see if we can get people to to fill it in again so that we can have a sense because it's you know it started off at 20 uh, when we started but we didn't get a good idea so all of you are available can please put this in so we have a good sense of who's around and uh, i think they're now 60 people so it'd be very handy if we can get a sense of everyone who's been able to benefit from this so um i really appreciate uh, you garrick providing this i mean i think we hope that we can get other lectures also from you and your colleagues. Um, would we be able to liaise with you on, you know, filling up some gaps and, and looking at things that are really very practical, um, you know, in, in other sort of um, investigations, you know, NHLS, we tend to find ourselves uh, sending off investigations or not using them very well. Um, okay. So perhaps we can liaise with you on other others in your, um, in your sort of, um, unit to elsewhere if you don't mind we okay. can link up no problem prof you can just email me and we'll be glad to from him especially on hematology side we'll be glad to provide any further wonderful um, further lectures and information right that's great so thank you i think uh, i'll just stop there i think we're about 38 out of the 57 people and just so that you can see who's around and you can share that um it's again mostly uh, interns medical officers and a few family physicians and other specialists Mm -hmm. and Southern Africa, Gauteng, some people from Northwest, really, and then Chuan and Kuruleni, besides most of them from, um, from so Johannesburg. So here you have a list. You can have a quick look at it. And that's your colleagues joining us. Thank you all very much. Um, really appreciate uh, you joining us. Thanks, Garrick, and uh, everyone. Keep well. Okay, have a good evening. Bye-bye.